This conference will now. Yes. Um, so thank you very much. And so I will present to you uh, Christina, who will introduce our speaker uh, in celebration of um, better speech and hearing mind. Christina. Yes, thank you. Um, so yes, um, as um, Cecile said, this is a better uh, speech and hearing month, the month of May. So the aphasia and other communication disorders task force um, is happy to have been able to invite Dr. Mira Goral. She is professor of speech language hearing sciences at Lehman College and the executive officer of speech language hearing sciences PhD program at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She's also an adjunct professor at the Center for Multilingualism in Society Across the Lifespan, the University of Oslo, and an adjunct research professor at NYU School of Medicine. Um, she has published journal articles and book chapters in the areas of bilingualism, multilingualism, aphasia, language attrition, and language and cognition in aging, and co-edited two books on multilingualism and bilingualism. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Garau, for being with us today. Thank you, Christina, and thank you everybody for inviting me. I'm very excited to talk to you today about uh, language intervention in multilingual individuals with aphasia. Um, oh, yes. So uh, what I'm hoping to cover today is uh, talk a little bit about aphasia in multilingual individuals. So the manifestation, some variables that contribute to the behavior we see and some mechanism that may account for the behavior we observe. Then I'm going to talk about some assessment challenges associated with um, uh, multilingual individuals with aphasia before turning to intervention with uh, multilingual individuals with aphasia. There is some background noise. Um, Just a reminder to please mute yourself as we already started the presentation. Thank you. And then um, maybe finish with some um, aspects of best practices and future direction. So who are multilingual individuals? Um, anybody who knows more than one language, perhaps. Uh, the definition can be um, flexible depending on the context and the um, research or clinical practice. But what counts when we think about who are multilingual individuals? Do they have to be proficient fully in both or all the languages to be counted as uh, bilinguals or multilinguals? Um, do they have to have high proficiency in all of their modalities? Some people can speak and understand the language but not read and write or vice versa. Um, do they have to use their both languages? What if they learned it some time ago but, not using, uh, but are not using it right now? And then in terms of what kinds of bilinguals we might um, expect to see, um, do they, uh, are they the, the kind of people who were exposed to both languages in early childhood and are uh, early bilinguals? Did they, learn, did they learn the second language later in childhood or later in life? Did they learn that language or acquire it by immersion or is it a foreign language? These variables may um, play a role in how we think about bilinguals and also in how the languages may be represented in the brain and affected in aphasia, as we will see soon. So there's been a big debate about the age of acquisition. That's a big variable that comes into play. And people have uh, asked whether there is a critical period after which we cannot uh, learn a language as efficiently. And a seminal um, work by Johnson and Newport um, explored that hypothesis that uh, maybe, and this is just a generic graph, uh, performance will be affected by the age of which you acquire the second language. So if this is the, the chronical age and this is some performance on some language measure, we may expect that there may be an age after which performance will drop precipitously. What they found, Johnson and Newport, in their study is that there is a relationship between age of acquisition and performance, but it's a lot more gradual and it actually continues following what we might expect to be the age of the critical period, which could be by some account five when maturation uh, proceeds or by some account uh, six when uh, there is a, an immersion in the school system or not, etc. Regardless of these aspects of uh, bilingualism that can take us a whole other lecture, 
there is a consensus today that we can think about multilingual individuals as those who use, who are users of more than one language. And so even if they're not proficient in all of the languages, and even if they have different proficiencies in the different modalities, or there are differences in terms of how they learn the language and when they learn the language, we can think about them as users of the languages. And this is true for the population we're going to look at. So if you do know or use or um, are proficient in multiple languages, what can we um, uh, assume about how that's represented in our brains? So roughly you can think about two um, approaches to that question. One, we can assume that uh, each language is uh, handled by a different neural networks in the brain and there is little overlap between them. And the networks can be associated with um, differences in, for example, age of acquisition or proficiency levels. There are some theories suggesting that we learn our first language in an automatic way, by handled mainly by a procedural sort of memory, versus uh, a second language, especially those who are learned um, formally in school. We are, uh, these languages may be handled by a declarative memory, so maybe these different systems are represented differently in the brain. The alternative approach is that a language is a language is a language. We're going to have an overlapping network in the brain that is associated with any language, regardless of the specifics of the language characteristics or the age of acquisition or the level of proficiency. And rather, all bilinguals um, share their networks of the languages. And what they also possess is a mechanism of control that allows for the relative activation or inhibition of the two languages or the multiple languages as needed. And so, um, whereas we found some evidence in neuroimaging studies to suggest that maybe there are different areas in the brains or networks that are activated during processing one language or another, lending support to some or non-overlapping of the neuronal networks, the uh, alternative approach suggests that any differences in the activation that one sees when people are instructed to conduct certain language uh, activities in one language or the other are really differences about the levels of activation and inhibition of the languages and it's the language control network that seems to may um, be differentiating these areas, these these activities and Abu Talebi and Green have proposed a network of control involving some aspects of the left hemisphere, um, prefrontal cortex, as well as some subcortical areas that may be associated with that language control. So if we think about our clinical population, we can see what happens in aphasia. So we all know what aphasia is, and I'm mostly talking about acquired um, impairment due to a stroke. And if we think about one relatively focal damage in the brain, we can ask the question if it's one network, we may expect impairment in all of the languages, or if there are differences in the networks observing the different languages, maybe we will see a differential impairment of one language or another. And similarly, we can think about the recovery patterns from aphasia. Do, are we going to see that the languages are going to be recovered in a parallel fashion? Because as processes happen and brain the brain changes with um, with the recovery, we're going to see the effect in all languages, or are we going to see some non-parallel patterns of recovery that will betray either some non-overlapping processes in the brain or uh, implicating the control mechanism. And so from the early days that uh, aphasia and multilingualism has been studied, um, people have identified several patterns of recovery. And um, in the 1880s, people uh, have suggested maybe it's the first language that was acquired that is going to be less uh, susceptible to damage. And a recent uh, systematic review by Kuzmina and colleagues suggests that maybe that is the case, that the first language tends to be more preserved in people with aphasia than other languages. But other scholars have suggested maybe it has to do with language use. If you're using the language a lot, that is going to be more preserved. And then Paradis and colleagues have suggested that maybe it has to do with pre-morbid proficiency or pre-stroke proficiency. So the languages that were more proficient before the stroke are going to still be more 
accessible or less impaired than the languages that were less proficient before the stroke. And people have identified some temporal pattern to that recovery. So sometimes one language seemed to recover first before others. And sometimes we even see these alternating patterns where one language may recover first, and then as a second language starts to recover, the first language shows some patterns of decline, or maybe even alternating fashion um, that has been termed alternating antagonistic recovery. These latter patterns may be more compatible with this idea of control. If the control system changes, so will the accessibility to either of the languages. So let's just take an example of what um, a multilingual person might look like. So this is a um, trilingual speaker who was born to Hebrew-speaking parents um, and was immersed in Hebrew in his early parts of his life. He was also exposed to English in very <coughs> early age, but then was not um, immersed in English and learned it as a second language in school. And then he also learned French in his late, early adulthood. In his 30s and 40s, he was immersed in English and French, living in the US and in Geneva, and used Hebrew less. At the time of his stroke, around mid 40s, he um, realized that his Hebrew is more accessible to him than his English, that was in turn more accessible than his French, and he showed some preference to his Hebrew, even though he didn't really use it much before the stroke. When we tested him on a couple of measures, um, he um, showed some areas of strength in all three languages, but when there were differences between in, among his, in his performance, we saw some ex, uh, ext extensive difficulty in French, his, less, his third acquired language. When we used another measure, uh, how efficient his uh, language production was, he had non-fluent aphasia, we saw that his Hebrew uh, was faster and more efficient than his two later acquired languages. So depending on the measure, we might have seen a different pattern, but we generally see some non-parallel pattern of impairment despite high proficiency in all three languages prior to the stroke. I'll come back to that point in a little bit. But we have identified different variables that can affect whether we are going to see parallel or non-parallel impairments and recovery patterns in aphasia. And these include age of acquisition, as I mentioned already, as well as proficiency before the stroke and what we can call level of ability after the stroke. Also, um, sociolinguistic variables, what is the language of the environment? What is the language that is being used? Um, do, do the people have um, literacy skills in all of their languages? Do they tend to mix their languages? So bilingual who speak with other bilingual people tend to mix their languages. That's very common and very typical. Some people do that more than others. Um, Spanish, English bilinguals in New York, for example, mix their languages all the time. That could affect what we're going to see in terms of the impairment and the recovery. And also some emotional and motivational attitudes toward the languages and, the, um, and, the, and their use. In terms of the mechanism that we can um, ascribe to these patterns uh, in multilingual aphasia, we can think about levels of activation of the languages that need to be met in order for the language to be accessible to the individual. And we can think about interference between the languages so that one language has to be somewhat inhibited when the person is trying to communicate in the other. And that mechanism of control I mentioned earlier would allow typical bilinguals to control which language is more active than the other and to reduce the interference among them when there is differential level of proficiency. Similarly, for recovery patterns and response to treatment, which I'll allude to later, we can think about um, two rough mechanisms that have been put forward to explain some of these. The competing mechanisms uh, theory put, um, put forward by Kieran and colleagues suggests that there is this interplay between levels of activation and levels of inhibition among the languages that will allow either um, benefits uh, following treatment in all the languages or um, evidence for competition between them. 
And similarly, the lingering suppression uh, hypothesis by, by uh, some work that I have done suggests that when bilinguals and multilinguals need to speak or work in a lower proficiency language or one that is less accessible to them, they need to suppress the more dominant language and that suppression can linger following the intervention. And I'm going to return to that when we talk about the intervention studies. So I'm going to turn now to talk about some assessment challenges. One of the greatest difficulty in working with multilingual people with aphasia is that we don't know what their language proficiency was before the stroke. When you work with monolingual individuals, you can assume that they were native speakers, highly proficient in their language. There may be some variation of vocabulary size, literacy skills, but by and large, they are proficient in their languages. This is not necessarily the case for individuals who are multilingual because we don't know what level of proficiency they had prior to the stroke. What we can do is ask them for their self ratings, but these are subjective. Moreover, the nature of multilingualism is that it is dynamic. So somebody can be highly proficient in one language at some point in their lives, but maybe after moving or after not using it for a while, there'll be some decline in those skills. And maybe a language that used to be the first language after years of living in another environment is no longer the most dominant one. So it's difficult to assess and asking what people with aphasia to reflect about these skills um, and burdening them with lengthy questionnaires about their levels of proficiency at each time in their lives could be um, too difficult to do. Similarly, the people who know them may not know all of their linguistic abilities and not throughout their lives. Um, so I'm just going to give you an example because we did have uh, for this individual the opportunity to hear some of his um, language abilities prior to the stroke. So this is the individual that I showed you with the trilingualism, um, but um, this is his uh, production in English after the stroke post-stroke. Uh, several uh, of the employees were, uh, were moving to the United States with me. Um, and um, uh, we uh, developed software for the, the animation uh, uh, animation uh, computer computer animation. So we hear some characteristics of aphasia. We hear a slow, hesitant speech production. We hear some word finding difficulties. Maybe we hear um, that he's a non-native speaker of the language but we don't have a good sense of what of the characteristics that we hear can be attributed to his aphasia or to his um, non-native proficiency in that language. It's not often the case, but we had a chance to obtain a um, audio clip of the same individual speaking before their stroke about a similar topic. Well, um, Animation Science is uh, today the leader in rule-based animation. Uh, rule-based animation is probably the uh, hottest new development in computer graphics. And the idea behind it is let the computer do anything that can be defined by a set of rules. And of course, that means uh, a great increase in productivity and so we can hear that if we didn't know, if we didn't have that clip, we may have assumed that the person was less proficient than he was actually in that language, which was not his first language. Additional challenges of assessing people who are multilingual and have aphasia relate to the assessment tools and to the assessment sessions. And I'll turn to them next. So we have some tests to evaluate people with aphasia, and we have some normative data for those 
the normative data at best are from monolingual individuals. Even if we have tests in different languages, we are not sure that they are comparable in their level of difficulty. And if we want to translate a test from one language to another, we have to assure that the adaptation takes into account the cultural context and the familiarity of different um, items on the test by these individuals from different cultures. So for example, this is very common in New York, but may not be clearly identifiable in other cultures in other countries. People who don't celebrate Christmas would not know what a wreath is. Um, this is a very good um, action naming item in Norway, but maybe not in southern India. And we have to assure that um, if we are using anything written, the person had the literacy skills or had them before the stroke. These are some additional examples. Um, if we want to elicit the verb pray, we have to think about what kind of religion we are dealing with in the community. And if we want to use the bilingual aphasia test pictures for assessing um, uh, reflexive sentences, we have to worry that in some cultures these pictures can be offensive. We also have linguistic considerations. So in this bilingual aphasia test that I mentioned, which is a um, fantastic aphasia test that was developed in more than 50 languages and is available for free, um, we had to adapt the, um, the items for the particular language, especially when phonological and semantic um, characteristics are concerned. So this is a um, word comprehension subtest in English. And you can see how phonological distractors are being targeted. These same pictures will elicit words that have no phonological similarity in another language, such as Spanish. So the same item on the same test, when um, adapted to Spanish, needed to use completely different pictures and um, completely different words to elicit the same phonological similarities. Beyond the test, we also have to worry about the testing. So in aphasia, we uh, like to get some repeated testing to establish some stability of a baseline and to be able to compare it to post-treatment measurements. So now we have to do repeating testing in two or three languages. Do we test them, uh, the individual, in both their languages in the same day, taking a break, or maybe um, test one language at a time? Do we do the repeated measures in several days of the same week or do we take a week per language? And you can see how that becomes very complex when we are talking about multilingual individuals. Do we use the same version of the test and have the person be exposed to the same items, and same words over and over again, or do we use comparable versions? Who should be testing then? Um, Maybe if we want to keep a quote-unquote monolingual mode, we should use a monolingual examiner. But if we're testing in a, lang in a country, say, here in the United States, we can assume that everybody knows English. So even if the monolingual speaker of English is testing English, when they are testing them in a, another language, we can assume that they know English. So then there is an in, un, unequal um, set up for the two languages. And so maybe it's just best to test by multilingual examiners to begin with, and therefore not respecting the monolingual mode that we were trying to achieve. People who are multilingual are very sensitive to their interlocutors and they know who can speak their languages and switching to another language in these circumstances is actually typical. And furthermore, once we obtain the results, we have some challenges in how to score and how to interpret them. So for example, here I noted a few cross-language influences that we have to watch out for. So if we have a naming test, the person can name the correct item in the target language, but they can also name them correctly in the non-tested language. Is it correct or incorrect? How do we score that? What if they produced a word that is a cognate, that is to say it is similar in the two languages, and we don't know if when they said limon, they said it in Spanish or attempted the lemon in English. I mentioned language mixing. A lot of people with aphasia mix their languages just like typical speakers. And we 
wanted to know whether they do it in a typical manner or atypical manner. By and large, the data suggests that people with aphasia mix their languages appropriately, as do typical individuals, but um, or neurologically typical individuals, but maybe they might do it more often when they encounter word finding difficulties, and it's better to produce a word in one language than not to say anything at all. And finally, there are grammatical errors that we might find in multilingual speakers with aphasia that we will have a hard time attributing to their aphasia. For example, if they have a grammatism in trouble with syntax and morphology versus to their lack of complete mastery of the language. Some of the errors that we see in non-native speakers are very similar to the errors we see in grammatism. So let me turn now to talk about intervention studies with multiple multilingual people with aphasia. As you all know, when we administer intervention with um, people with aphasia, we have uh, potential several objectives. We can uh, aim to restore some of the impaired abilities or aim for reconstitution of these abilities by um, circumventing some of the affected areas. But we could also aim for compensation, trying to get the people with aphasia to communicate despite their linguistic difficulties. And our approaches to treatment can be impairment-based, trying to uh, restore the linguistic ability that is impaired, or could be communication-based. In terms of outcome, we can measure a variety of outcomes uh, to, de uh, to denote improvement. But typically in aphasia, especially in the chronic phases, we would see small changes. We will see them ongoing. And we will aim to capture some sort of generalization beyond what is being directly targeted in the treatment. So if we think about language intervention with multilingual people with aphasia, one additional decision we have to make is which language to treat. Sometimes the answer is, simple because what, available, what is available to us in terms of the clinicians are only monolingual speakers and so the language of the environment, the language of the majority typically gets treated more often. But if we can, um, should we administer treatment in both languages or in the second language or in the first, what is the preference of the clients and their family members? And maybe the more important question is then if we treat in one language, will the other language benefit as well? Another question that has come up, but there is very little evidence to date, is should we mix the languages in the treatment? So if I have a bilingual clinician working with a bilingual individual, is it a good thing to use either language or should we restrict the therapy to be in one language only? Finding in the literature suggests that we do see within language generalization or within language change when treatment is administered in the first language as well as in other languages. And maybe there is some advantage to um, administering therapy in the first language if it's also the more dominant one. In terms of cross-language change, um, the question is, can we generalize the effect of the treatment from one language to the non-treated language? And here we have found that there is generalization to a more proficient language, but maybe not necessarily to a less proficient language. And that could be explained by mechanisms of spreading activation within the languages and across the languages when there is enough activation to support the um, generalization. There is also a suggestion in the literature that you can find generalization from a non-L1 to other non-L1 languages, but not to the first language. And here we find this mechanism of suppression explaining these results, whereby the first language, if it's the more dominant one, needs to be inhibited when working on another language. And so that lingering suppression will not allow us to see any benefits from the treatment to the um, first language that was not treated. This is important, especially in the context of 
the typical situation where individuals who are bilingual and have stronger L1 and their language is not the language of the environment, but are likely to receive therapy in the language of the environment. When we looked at the review of, the, uh, of, some, of some of the studies, um, cross-language generalization tends to occur in more than half of the reported cases. Mostly we find it when there are comparable post-stroke ab abilities in the languages, so when there is no difference in the proficiency following the stroke. And mixed language treatment has not been studied in the literature. There's only one currently published study that looked at it and found it not to be beneficial. So our ongoing study aims to identify these factors that may affect when and under what circumstances we might find cross-language generalization. So here I'm going to just uh, briefly review some data from six individuals who were enrolled in our study. You can see that they vary in age and um, the languages they know, and as well as the age of language acquisition of their different languages. I will point out that all of them were highly proficient in all of their languages prior to the stroke, and that most of them had one language that appeared more accessible to them after the stroke. It was the first language for four of the six individuals, but none L1 after the stroke for two of the individuals. I put a question mark here because participant two seems to have comparable proficiency in both her languages. They vary also in their severity levels and they were all uh, at the chronic stages. For testing, following a consent form, uh, we administered an extensive language background questionnaire to get at the proficiency and self-rating proficiency and the use of the, all of the languages. We administered the Western phasia battery and the cognitive linguistic quick test. And for our repeated measures, we used an extensive language battery that targeted both expressive and receptive language at the word level and the sentence level, and also elicited connected language production. And we did it in each of the languages. So the assessment was extensive, and it took us usually over a week to complete, but we tried to keep each session relatively short so the participants will be able to complete it. I want to focus on the connected language production measures we used. And here we had um, WH questions that uh, encouraged the participant to answer in one question, in one sentence, questions such as, what do you like to do for your, on your birthday? We had a sequence of pictures they would look at and we'll ask them to tell a little story. And we will also ask them to tell a personal narrative, for example, about a recent trip that they took. And we had a lot of measures that we could have looked at in these connected speech samples, but we focused uh, primarily on the um, measure of efficiency, how many words they produced in total in regardless which language, with repetition, in false starts, and all of these good things, versus the number of words that actually were intelligible and accurate and contributed to the meaningful, the meaning of the story. So we looked at that proportion, CIUs over TVUs, to assess their connected language production. And what these measures allowed us to do is not to worry about whether all the tests that we are using are comparable, although in our language battery we attempted to do that um, psycholinguistically as well. So each individual received a, um, a series of treatment blocks sequentially in each language or mixed. Um, and only participants one through four received the mixed treatment language block. And it was different for participant one, two, and three, whereby we allowed the use of both Spanish and English in the sessions. And for uh, participant four, who um, whose language sessions were blocked for language. So she was treated in both her English and her Farsi, but in any given session, she was only using one language. This is an example of the first model of mixed language treatment I mentioned, where uh, we allowed the participant to use both languages in the session. 
And what we did is the clinician would introduce the uh, activity in one language and the stimuli in one lang in the same one language. But if the participant switched to another language, she followed that lead and switched to the language that the participant was using. So let's look at them. Let's hear an example. So you see when she switched into an, into Spanish, the clinician followed that lead. In terms of the treatment, we used a variety of treatment approaches common in our field. We didn't um, care to look for a particular treatment and its efficacy, but rather we wanted to see within language and cross-language generalization effects. And so we tailored the treatment to the particular needs of the individual. Our outcomes were varied, as can be expected for this heterogeneous population. And we focused on the generalization measure that I mentioned above, um, CIUs over TVUs. So I'll briefly uh, uh, just give you a glance of a glimpse of some of the data that we have obtained. All of this chart will look pretty much the same, where we have percent CIUs over TVUs on the y-axis. We have three measures, the WH questions, the narratives, and the sequences, all connected language production. And we have the two languages for this individual, English here and Spanish here, following a, so English following English treatment within language generalization, English following Spanish treatment, cross language generalization, and English following mixed treatment. And similarly here for Spanish. And what we can see is this person was quite mild. He had good proficiency, especially in Spanish in terms of his percent uh, CIUs over TVUs, but we do see that in his English, whereas he showed some improvement after treatment in English, he, saw, he showed some decline after treatment in Spanish. Participant two was pretty proficient in both of her languages, and we see high performance across the board, with some uh, cross-language negative effect and some with cross-language positive effects. Participant three was much more impaired. She had a lot of difficulty producing CIUs. And we do see improvement in her Spanish after treatment in Spanish. That's her first language. And we see some decline in her English following treatment in Spanish. Participant four was the one that got the mixed treatment block, but not within the same session. And she showed good improvement in her Persian as well as in her English. These were the two languages that were treated. And not much change with some trend toward improvement in German, which was the language she was not treated in. Participant five, here we have an aggregate rather than for each task of all connected language production. This is um, um, from the PhD dissertation of now Dr. Lerman. She, this person, this individual showed some improvement in his Hebrew following treatment and some decline in his English following treatment in Hebrew. And a more clear pattern was shown for the sixth participant with improvement in English following treatment in English, but decrease in English following treatment in Hebrew. So overall, we see some patterns of improvement within language as well as across language, but mostly we also see some decline in the language that was not treated for the more accessible language in the cases of P5 and P6, and also for the less accessible language in the cases of P1, 2, and 3. So what can we say based on these uh, results? We can see that there is a lot of heterogeneity and complexity to the study of multilingual people with aphasia. 
We have evidence for some within language generalization, which is probably uh, attributed, can, can be attributed to spreading activation. We saw mixed patterns for cross-language generalization. There was some spreading activation, especially when the language abilities were comparable, but we also saw some cross-language inhibition, uh, which can be attributed to this process of lingering suppression that I mentioned. And maybe there are competing mechanisms that include both activation and inhibition that complicate the picture. Mixed language treatment could be useful when it's appropriate and feasible, but our evidence so far suggests that blocking the sessions for language may be more efficient than using both languages at the same time. So let's wrap up. In summary, we've seen some assessment challenges. We saw some intervention challenges and decisions and the heterogeneity of the population we're dealing with. In terms of best practices, I think the connected language production task is a good avenue, even if time consuming and labor intensive, to capture change following treatment. We have to be mindful of language mixing and consider carefully the individual variables and how they play a role in what we observe in terms of the assessment and the treatment outcomes. And we have to be especially careful to see and to expect some temporary inhibition in one of the languages following treatment in another. Future directions could um, include the study of additional participants and additional languages to understand the role of these variables that I mentioned. I'm also curious to know and find out more about the time frame and the domain of those activation and inhibition processes. Will that lingering suppression linger after some time when the person starts using that language more extensively? We have evidence that the inhibition is only temporary, but it would be nice to know more about the time frame of that inhibition. And also if the processes are specific to lexical items and structures in the language or more globally to the level of activation of the language. We're currently in the process of conducting a systematic review of currently available studies of cross-language generalization, so stay tuned. I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank my colleagues and research assistants at Lehman College and at the Graduate Center. I'd like to thank the participants and my funding sources. And now I'll be happy to answer some questions. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Grawl. Um, it's always fascinating as a non-speech language pathologist to hear about um, really the complexity with language, uh, culture, literacy, all of those things um, bound together, having aphasia um, affect all of that. So opening now the uh, session to any questions that um, some of you may have. You can also use the chat box for any um, questions. Okay. Just giving folks a chance. If you have a question, you can unmute yourself as well. I just don't want anyone talking to themselves for a while there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Gural, um, thank you too. We're, we're looking forward to the results of that systematic review and all your other plans as well. Um, maybe it's a topic that we can um, um, have you over again for um, in the near future. Um, uh, if there are no questions, I would like to thank you. Um, Christina, did you have anything that you wanted to say? Sorry to call on you. No, 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 that's fine. I was actually just unmuting myself. I actually had a question, uh, Dr. Gural. Um, I was curious about your thoughts on um, kind of, you know, self-reported proficiency of SLPs. Um, you know, we are getting, you know, in our program more students, you know, who are bilingual or multilingual. And just something I, I wonder about is just in general, you know, I know the numbers reported are quite low for the, you know, number of SLPs who, who say they are proficient enough. And, you know, 
do you think you know we need some sort of measure some sort of standard so people can you know feel qualified to say that they are bilingual and have some sense or uh, proficient enough you know and have some sense that they could practice in that area yeah that's a great question and i think that um um there is some difficulty with um with the idea of self rating so in uh, studies with healthy mon bilingual individuals studies by golan and others there show um, there is a pretty high correlation between self-rating and any kind of subject, excuse me, subjective measures that you can use. Nevertheless, the correlation is not perfect and sometimes it's quite low. So then you're thinking, can I really rely on that self-report? And also people in, may interpret that question about how proficient you are in different ways. Um, so the self-rating is, is decent when you don't have anything else, but you might want to have some other measure to um, allow that uh, level of comfort and competence. In New York State, actually, they do have um, a bilingual extension to some of their certification in the state. And so people have to actually take an exam. And I don't know how the exam, how great the exam is, but it is available in a variety of languages. And so the student who takes the exam and finish a few courses and does whatever they need to do, they can actually be certified as a bilingual clinician. Um, but I think we should make it um, easier for clinicians to have that status because if they do have these language abilities that could be a great asset to our client population, we should encourage them to use them. And so maybe there are ways to um, classify that level of proficiency and to develop some standards as to what is important. So maybe literacy skills are less critical than being able to communicate in that language, especially for uh, more severe aphasia, for example. So I see a couple of questions in the written. There's a, yeah, there's a question on the chat box here from Julia. Are there any other freely accessible bilingual aphasia tests other than the BATS or other paid tests that you like and prefer? So that's a difficult question because um, there aren't too many tests that are available for uh, bilinguals. And there are several languages in different, several, tests in different languages, but we really have no norms for bilingual individuals. And frankly, it's difficult to obtain norms because bilinguals and multilinguals vary so much in their language history and their abilities. So the BAT is a decent screening test, but it has a lot of problems and not all the languages have been adapted appropriately. And also, for example, it was developed first in English. So there is very little attention to morphology, which is a big aspect of the language in other languages. So there are some disadvantages, um, but um, it's the best tool we have so far. So I developed that bilingual battery uh, for, actually it's a multilingual battery for English, Spanish, Hebrew, and Russian. And I haven't normed it either, and I I think I need a few more items in each task, although it's pretty effective in um, getting a picture of the participants. Several of the main aphasia batteries, like the Western aphasia battery and the BDAE, were adapted to other languages, so these are pretty good versions, the PALPA as well. Um, and now there is a, a big effort in Europe um, undergoing to adapt the CAT, the Comprehensive Aphasia Test, into multiple languages. And there they did a very nice job trying to um, make it comparable in, in psycholinguistic um, uh, characteristics of the different languages. And it has been adopted already to many languages. So that could be a useful tool. Nevertheless, I think that um, Whenever you are looking at specific items, at naming and sentence structures, you're bound to lose some of the um, language-specific and cultural-specific um, appropriate uh, aspects of a test. Thank There's you. another question, um, Dr. Gural. Thank you for that. Um, from Leora, uh, very interested in the concept of inhibition. What do you consider sufficient inhibition in order to suppress L1? Would you suppress L1 outside the therapy session or just in the therapy session? Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, I 
I'm not attempting to suppress the language, but I think it happens in uh, a treatment block. So if we have an intensive treatment block uh, working in, um, in a lower proficiency language, say L2, the consequences is, is that maybe that there is a, an attempt to inhibit the language, not intentionally, the first language, in order to allow the activation level to reach a threshold for communication and work in the less proficient, say, non-L1. So I think that it happens temporarily when the person is focusing on a lower proficiency language. And we've seen it also in bilinguals without aphasia, when they're immersed in their L2, they may have difficulty retrieving words in their otherwise more dominant L1. And so that is, I think, what happens in the treatment session. So um, if the main language of that person outside of the therapy session is L1, we're not going to see as strong a suppression. But if they are um, exposed to the L2 in other environment, in their other environment, we may see that lingering suppression of the first language. But I don't think I would suppress it intentionally in order to facilitate the second language. I think one of the <clears throat> main um, lessons that I've learned working with multilingual people is that they want to have access to their languages and it's part of their identity. And they, and they are very happy when we offer them the possibility of working in all of their languages, not just one of their languages. Okay, those are interesting questions. Anything else from the group? Okay, thank you so much. And I think um, it was such a fitting topic for Better Speech and Hearing Month. Um, thank you, Dr. Goral, for taking the time um, and doing this for us. Thank this you recording. Very much for Yes, this recording will be accessible for some of your colleagues and we'll, we'll be downloading it and posting it um, and um, let us know how uh, if, if you want any more information on that. Um, and with that, I think we can end this session and see you for our next virtual happy hour. Um, it's usually the third Thursday of the month. Um, I believe um, it doesn't happen um, all the time, but we'll, we'll um, send out information as soon as we can. Um, thank you again. Thank you.